So to begin a few words with you this morning, so I'm going to share them. Uh, to paraphrase something that Abraham Joshua Heschel said about the Jewish people, places where people study to become rabbis and cantors are just like all other schools, only more so. All of the opportunities and drama in personal and academic pursuits of those years present themselves even as those called to the clergy pursue their degrees and ordination. And this includes something many of you are familiar with, which is becoming close to certain teachers and professors, so much so that they can come to feel like they are part of your own family. Whether or not the professors feel the same way is often an open question. For me, one such teacher at JTS was Rabbi Joe Brody, the long-serving dean of student life, confidant and friend to many, over 50 plus years of service to the JTS community. He has been to our home, we have been to his, we have celebrated many happy occasions together. We have kept in touch, sometimes sporadically, but fairly consistently over the years. Me, him, and my late good friend Adam Feldman even played golf together once at Van Cortland Park in the Bronx, and we laughed our way around all 18 holes. It took me about 25 years to refer to him as Joe instead of Rabbi, which he immediately asks everyone to do, by the way. And unfortunately, just before Passover, Joe lost his daughter, Rachel Brody, rather suddenly. And Rachel was a noted Jewish educator in the San Francisco area. I start by mentioning her in part because I hope you'll remember her name. And perhaps you'll look into her work, and if you come across it, maybe you will absorb and then perpetuate some of her astoundingly creative ideas, which brought such nachas to her father. Her mother passed away some years ago as well. I mention Joe Brody in part because I love him, and in part because it reminds me of another JTS lifer who had a big impact on me and taught something relevant for today's elevated Shabbat. Neil Gilman was not a personal confidant of mine, and he would not have presumed that I considered myself to be part of his family. Neil was a theology professor who taught rabbis and lay people alike how to talk about God. His classic assignment, which was writing a paper titled The God I Believe In, is still part of my conversion curriculum and the papers that it results in never fail to amaze me. I appreciate this assignment's power so much that I recommend that everybody find a way to write about their own personal theology, whether you share it with those you care about or keep it to yourself. In exploring God, we are also exploring ourselves, and Neil Gilman understood that quite well. He taught an idea that sticks with me. Possibly I heard it from him when I served as a teaching assistant in a large adult education class he was involved with through a program called Context. Some of you here may even remember that program. He pointed out something which in retrospect is so obvious, but it can take a great teacher to do just that. Otherwise, we would have done it ourselves. Which is that in the Torah, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are not connected. The first is a one-day holiday, yes, only one day, marked by blowing horns on the first day of the seventh month. Yom Kippur follows 10 days later with all kinds of instructions and restrictions toward the cleansing of our souls, the priestly rituals of which are detailed in this morning's Torah reading. Gilman correctly surmised that Rosh Hashanah absorbed some of the holiness 
that spilled over backwards from Yom Kippur and over many, many years became what we now refer to as a high holy day. The 10-day period from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur is not referred to as a special unit of time in the Torah. We are not commanded to count those days as we are the Omer period that we are in now. Yet it has become a period of elevated introspection and of repentance, and it has its own name. The Aseret Yimei Tshuva, the 10 days of repentance, of consideration of where and who we have been and where we hope to go because the Jewish people have made it all of that. In other words, what Gilman taught is that sometimes we make new connections between old holidays and we learn and we grow from them. He taught how that happened between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and this week, we get to absorb a period of time on the calendar that is still being developed as this very Shabbat connects to new holidays. Whether we recognize not just Yom HaShoah and Yom Ha'atzma'ut, but also the days between them as a time to reflect on the meaning and message of both is something that remains up to each of us. As you probably know, last Wednesday night and Thursday was Holocaust Remembrance Day, assigned the date 27 Nisan, in commemoration of the beginning of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Israel's 74th birthday, follows a week later. Program note, if you plan to be there for Israel's 75th, book your hotel rooms now. Something about that number just resonates. There is just one week between these two modern holy days. A mathematical and calendrical fact which at one point some decades ago led a visionary to suggest an idea that I assume was dismissed out of hand more than once. Like the Bob Newhart bit about Abner Doubleday pitching the idea of baseball. The reply being, no way, it will never work, it's too complicated. So what was this revolutionary Jewish idea? We'll take teenagers to Poland for Yom HaShoah and walk with them from Auschwitz to Birkenau. We'll call it the trek, no, the procession, no, the purposeful walk, no, we'll call it the march. We'll call it the March of the Living. Is that it? No, then we'll put them on planes and bring them to Israel where, where they will celebrate Yom Ha'atzma'ut. The response in my <clears throat> mind is, so that you know, sounds like a lot of <clears throat> excuse me, logistics to manage. How many teens are we talking about? Like 30 or 40? No, says the visionary, I'm talking about thousands. One day, maybe tens of thousands. And not only that, we'll bring survivors and rabbis and cantors and educators who will march right along with them. And they will tour and learn about the sites of devastation in Poland and triumph in Israel. And they'll take classes beforehand and they'll stay in touch afterward. And I'm sure like Newhart's imagined conversation with Doubleday, the response was, it will never work. But it has, and many thousands of teens have been positively impacted by the March of the Living. I staffed that trip twice, and each time was incredibly powerful, even life-changing. This year, our own senior in high school son, Zev Englander, was signed up to go with his Donna Klein Jewish Academy community. And a few months ago, something very weird happened. There were still COVID flare-ups, and Israel was taking the matter of national closures very seriously and implementing them very quickly. New heart bits aside, the march is incredibly difficult logistically. Not knowing if Israel will be open or closed while you are in Poland, 
or if it will close while kids are there, made the march in Israel too big a lift. And in something that was incredibly well-meaning, but which I knew viscerally on some level was not going to work. The march canceled the Israel part of the experience, but declared it was going ahead with the Poland component. Now this was, I'm sure, a searingly difficult decision to make. Is Poland without Israel better than no march experience at all was a question that was debated at the highest levels. I felt very sad for the group. Somehow, as a people, we rose from the ashes of the Shoah to establish and build an amazing country, and the kids would see the ashes. Actually, the ashes, which still emerge from the depths at the sites of death camps, and as many of you know, are gathered in a giant domed memorial at Majdanek. But they would not then experience the rebirth that Israel represents. For those who had marched before, it was unfathomable. As I have said before, the spiritual highlight of my life outside of witnessing childbirth was taking off on the aforementioned flight from Poland, knowing we were headed to a safe, secure, and vibrant Jewish state in Israel. I still get chills thinking about it every time. And though I don't know if I will ever have the strength to staff this trip again, I think it is why our friend Rabbi Josh Brody, no relation to Joe, has done it 13 times. As you can guess, the question as to whether this was the right or wrong decision was negated by the war in Ukraine. When that invasion began, us March families knew it was only a matter of time before the whole trip was canceled. Unless the tanks turned around very quickly, there was simply no way to do what is effectively a sacred pilgrimage in a country that was in the process of absorbing thousands of refugees. In fact, the JCC in Krakow, which is a site we visit, turned its operations and building over to helping those displaced by the war. And we heard that some of the hotels marchers typically stay in, at least four to a room, had done the same. Canceling this impactful Jewish educational experience is hardly the most significant result of this horrendous incursion that has upended the lives of so many and called on so many nations, communities, and individuals to help in some meaningful way. But for our kids, it was a lost opportunity that they are unlikely to ever get back. The march did take place in a scaled-down way. About 2,000 people attended. The president of Poland addressed the gathered group at the official ceremony at Birkenau, as did former Israeli Chief Rabbi Lau, who has been on more marches than even Josh Brody, and who always speaks with passion and energy that belie his age. He is an Ud Mutsal Me'esh, a brand plucked from the fires of the smokestacks and could have just as easily perished as he did survive, first being taken prisoner at the astonishingly young age of just seven years old. This was already going to be a different and special march because it is becoming clear that marching with survivors who are old enough to remember anything about the experience of the Shoah is an era that is coming to a close. It was billed as the last march with survivors, and a few of them did make the trip to the side of their persecution and liberation to inspire the few teens who were there to bear lifelong witness to the darkest period of Jewish history. As you would guess, the overall theme was passing the torch to the next generation which will now be responsible for Holocaust remembrance and education. Not too far removed from the difficulty of deciding whether to go ahead with or to cancel the march is the question of what themes the march can reasonably include without diluting its core purpose, which is teaching teens and adults something of this devastating era so that its memory 
will be perpetuated. Early on, March organizers realized that if this experience was only about history, it would be important and very sad, but it would not make a huge difference in helping to address and work toward the end of destructive hatred in this world. So here's a little bit of a quiz. Which of the following topics do you think were mentioned during this year's March programming as being fundamentally connected to its mission? The heroism of black soldiers in World War II and Jewish participation in the American Civil Rights Movement. The war in Ukraine and how Poland has stepped forward to help so many thousands of refugees. Recognizing and honoring the victims of anti-Semitic attacks in Europe, the United States, and India. A delegation of Muslims from all across the Middle East to emphasize the importance of Arab-Israeli relationships? It's a trick question. All four of those topics and more were mentioned, even as the tragic and murderous events of the Shoah were recounted to a new generation in some of the places where they happened not so very long ago. The memory of the six million has to be with us always, and it is a memory that is not confined to a day or a week. But honoring this week-long period as one that is set aside for reflection and heightened spiritual and humanitarian consciousness may be one way we can make sure these days are as much a part of Jewish life as are Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Perhaps the Shabbat in between Yom HaShoah and Yom HaAtzma'ut will eventually have its own special name and some of its own liturgy, like Shabbat Shuvah, between the High Holy Days. I hope so, because it is up to us not only to keep memory alive, but to eradicate the kind of hatred that led to our near destruction and to replace it with understanding, respect, and appreciation for life. Shabbat Shalom.